Hi, I'm Shomit Ghosh. I'm a lecturer at UC Berkeley, and I want to talk to you today about innovation. So I have a bunch of uh, PowerPoint slides here, so let's get started with those. All right, so my talk is titled Crisis as Catalyst. Uh, it's how COVID-19 is impacting healthcare innovation, and hopefully, as you'll see, uh, it's also impacting innovation in every other area. Uh, healthcare is a really good example of how uh, COVID-19 is, is changing the future. So uh, COVID-19 is having the same impact on business models as that asteroid had, hit, had what hit the planet a long time ago and wiped out all dinosaur life. Life was reordered, life was remade. The same is happening with COVID-19. Uh, as an entrepreneur for a very long time, my perpetual question was, what does the future look like? There's always a perplexing problem, and if you get it wrong, um, you go out of business. So how do you get the answer to this right? Well, if you look at what's going on in the field of healthcare, so the United Nations has laid out what our future healthcare needs will be. Um, and basically what they've said is that what we need is high volume healthcare, which is scalable, which is contactless going forward. So these are our future healthcare provisioning needs. If you look at what COVID-19 is doing for us today, um, it's also requiring the same thing. It's requiring high volume healthcare, which is contactless, which is scalable. So essentially what we're seeing is that the future is now. Uh, the COVID-19 present in the area of healthcare innovation is defining our post-COVID-19 future in the area of healthcare innovation. Uh, two basic guideposts in our discussion. Uh, one is that human uh, healthcare is a human right. We don't have enough of it anywhere, either in the developing world or the developed world. But it is a human right. It's something that we all deserve. And healthcare is also a zero-sum game, meaning if you spend uh, a dollar on condition X, it's a dollar that you cannot spend on condition Y. So you have to pick the right condition so that you can spend your money uh, in the most impactful way. So healthcare is all about impact. It's about creating models that uh, can help deliver healthcare as a human right and can focus on optimal usage of our resources. Um, Impact-driven innovation, what does that mean? Well, simply we can turn this into a very, very simple math equation. If you think about A being impact and B being complexity, what we're trying to find is problems, problems that have impact, large impact, but which have small enough values of B that they're solvable. We're trying to find the largest ratios of A to B, impact to complexity. And it turns out that digital healthcare solutions have the biggest impact because uh, they're so ubiquitous. Uh, we all have mobile phones with us. And because those, those mobile devices produce so much data that tell us so much. So the COVID-19 crisis is focused on the A-B equation. Uh, how do we have impact? How do we innovate scalable non-pharmaceutical interventions today? Because we don't have a vaccine as yet with maximum impact health. And this goes back to healthcare being a zero-sum game. This is the focus of how do we innovate to solve our problems in the age of COVID-19? Finding those A to B equations with large values of A, tractable values of B. Um, here's another way of looking at it. If X is the COVID-19 present and Y is the post-COVID-19 future, and we're all, all looking for impact, uh, getting that large A to B ratio, that innovation function, um, solving this in the COVID-19 world, uh, finding the innovation which is impactful there, looks like this. F of X is equal to A over B, finding impact. In the future, we need to find the same sorts of solutions. We need to find impact. It's A over B once again. So essentially f of x is equal to f of y the covid-19 future excuse me the covid-19 present defines a post covid-19 future uh, so it solves the entrepreneur's challenge covid-19 has brought the future to us if we're able to solve the healthcare scalability equation today in the age of covid-19 we may actually be able to find uh, solve the healthcare as a human right problem going forward so we may finally be able to uh, provide equity in provisioning healthcare um, digital health has the biggest impact on, 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 uh, on health, healthcare. Uh, the reason for this is that, um, digital devices are ubiquitous. That's uh, so what they allow us to meet patients where they are. Everyone essentially has a mobile device. Um, and digital devices are di uh, driven by data. So they're very targeted and they allow us to provide bridges to care, provide the appropriate bridges to care for each and every one of us. And it turns out that digital platforms um, provide solutions in diagnosis, prevention, even treatment. And this is what's exciting. 
Uh, and this helps us solve our, our problem both in the COVID-19 present and also in our post-COVID-19 future. Uh, digital health is a very broad spectrum. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side here was an interview with the CEO of Novartis, the pharmaceutical firm. And uh, it turns out that doing drug discovery, so using big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence to discover new drugs is a very difficult problem. On the right-hand side, what you see is a um, screenshot from your typical uh, mobile phone activity tracker. Uh, both of these sorts of solutions are, they both have, have merit and they're worthy, but they both have the challenges for entrepreneurs. Um, the problems on the left are very complex, so the values of B are very big. So remember, we're trying to find uh, large values of A and, and basically manageable values of B. Um, problems such as the one on the left may be difficult for startup entrepreneurs to do. And um, for solutions on the right-hand side, where the value of B is very small, um, there's not a lot of defensibility in there. There's, there's no barrier to entry for competition. So once again, startups will never have enough money to innovate on those large B problems, leave that for the giants, like those large pharmaceutical firms. We really want to find problems and innovate on, on them uh, where the, the values of A are large. It's a large problem. But with the value of B is tractable, it's something that's a, a solvable problem. So you look at the uh, the spectrum of innovation with step counters at one end, drug discovery at the uh, other end. It's discovering this this golden middle. This is where the virtualization of healthcare exists and where the most impact can be had. Here's a great example for it. This is a paper that was published in the Lancet in January of 2020, and it was using the Fitbit, the ubiquitous Fitbit, to be able to diagnose the onset of the flu. Uh, this paper was from before the um, the outbreak of the COVID-19 crisis, so this just has to do with flu, which is a seasonal affliction around the world. Um, and what they did with the Fitbit was they looked at resting heart rates and they looked at activity levels. And through this, they were able to predict the onset of the flu. And if you see the excerpt of text at the bottom, you can see that the, uh, the correlations were actually quite high, 0.84 to 0.97. So here's a very scalable way to address a problem that existed before uh, COVID-19, which is the diagnosis of, of flu, the outbreak of flu, um, is certainly an issue today in the age of COVID-19 and will continue to be an issue even after we have a, have a, uh, a vaccine for COVID-19 because seasonal flu will not go away. Um, another aspect of COVID-19 is hypoxia, uh, the levels of oxygen in your blood. Uh, going back to our Fitbit, Fitbit actually helps you monitor blood oxygen levels. So here's a solution that can be applied today in the COVID-19 present. And once again, once that, that disease is conquered and vanquished, uh, the applicability for it continues because blood oxygen levels uh, can be uh, used to help diagnose your sleep apnea. Um, COVID-19 has created a lot of mental health challenges for us. And you can see the uh, some of the uh, excerpt articles here on the left. Uh, it's caused a lot of strain on, on people individually. And it's also uh, really reduced, if not eliminated, access to healthcare, mental health care providers. So this is a big problem today amidst the COVID-19 crisis. But it turns out that mental health issues have, have always been a challenge and will continue to be a challenge. So you can see that the UN has tagged uh, depression as being the leading cause of disability worldwide. So um, mental health is an issue today under COVID-19 and will continue to be an issue going forward. How can we solve a problem today and I'll also solve our problems going forward? It turns out that digital health, mental health diagnosis can be done uh, in a many, many different ways using the signals from your mobile devices. So if you're suffering from mental health issues, um, diagnosis can be delivered at scale using your mobile device. Uh, this provides high volume health care, it's completely contactless, completely applicable today in the world of COVID-19 and all the, the stresses and strains of that crisis, completely applicable tomorrow, even after the, uh, the disease has been vanquished. Not only can digital uh, mental health be um, dispensed for diagnosis, but you can also dispense it for actually doing therapy. A couple of papers that you see here uh, is for doing talk therapy using um, artificial intelligence and, uh, and online chatbots, um, helping to deliver high volume healthcare that is contactless. So high, vo um, high volume digital men mental health therapy using automated uh, technologies. Uh, Stanford, which was a paper that was on the bottom of the previous page, even went so far as to release this online. 
this is Wobot. This is their online chat application. Um, giving access to uh, mental health care to people who may not otherwise be able to access it, either because of lack of availability or because of social distancing uh, requirements. And uh, it would be exciting actually to marry uh, Wobot with some cutting edge computer science techniques to actually even generate uh, personas, physical personas, to help people uh, go through their talk therapy. The digital mental health has been researched uh, for many years and uh, lots of uh, breakthroughs there for, for um, diagnosis, treatment, therapy, things like that. And because of digital, we're actually now able to provide uh, digital mental health care uh, at scale and also bring equity of provisioning that to, to broader populations. High volume healthcare, once again, that's contactless. Um, because of COVID-19, the US uh, has actually started to change regulations to enable um, remote uh, uh, healthcare provisioning. So from the AMA, et cetera, uh, it turns out that in developing nations where healthcare resources are in much shorter supply, this sort of virtualization has, has already been under development, but this goes to show that uh, we can find solutions that work perhaps here in the United States, uh, but if we can make it work here, uh, there is demand for it elsewhere on the planet as well. Uh, we don't have enough healthcare no matter where you live in the world. Here's another example of uh, a large uh, A, tractable B sort of an innovation equ equation. It has to do with curve flattening. Um, because we don't have uh, a vaccine for COVID-19 as yet, our most effective tool for controlling that has been curve flattening. And uh, how does this apply post COVID-19 once we do have a vaccine for the disease? Well, if you look at something like cardiovascular disease here, it's the, uh, the largest cause of mortality in India. So a very big, big problem, very big impact in a developing country. Uh, it turns out it's a large factor here in the United States as well. You know, half of Americans have cardiovascular disease. So what if here in the US you could flatten this curve? What if you could flatten this curve to the extent that you could prevent almost a million cardiovascular disease events, uh, gain two and a half million quality adjusted life years, and save $42 billion in healthcare costs. How could you do this? And um, the answer is you apply behavioral economics. So all of the figures on the previous page are illustrated by this article on the bottom. Uh, and that's by using behavioral economics to drive positive behavior and thereby achieve all of the savings we saw on the previous page. And behavioral economics has been, it turns out, uh, pretty broadly used within the area of, of uh, cardiovascular issues. And behavioral economics is exactly that same technique and technology that Amazon uses to get you to buy the, push the buy button. So it's influencing human behavior uh, in one instance, in the e-commerce instance of getting to do something like buy something, but it can also be used to achieve a beneficial impact in something as important as healthcare, curve flattening. Once again, delivering high volume healthcare that's contactless. Um, one of the aspects of uh, COVID-19 has been the uh, acute strain that's placed on healthcare systems, leading us to run out of inpatient beds. This has been an issue in, in countries like Italy. It's now an issue here in the US. And even without COVID-19, it turns out that we were running out of inpatient beds even here in the US because of the aging population. So here's a problem that's uh, acute today in the age of COVID-19, but is also reflective of, of a longer term problem that we have here in the US. How could you solve today's problem and also solve, by extension, solve a problem that will apply tomorrow? Um, and that's through virtualizing care by doing hospital at home. Hospital at home is a combination of, of monitoring technologies, uh, spending your convalescence actually in the comfort of your own home. Uh, and these programs have been proven uh, to be fairly effective, both in terms of cost savings and quality of results. Uh, pioneering, pioneering work done here by Johns Hopkins University. But this is a way of reducing the strain on inpatient beds in the hospital by helping people achieve recoveries uh, at home by remote monitoring and also some uh, telehealth by healthcare providers. So once again, this is a way of delivering high volume healthcare that's contactless, solving a problem that's that's uh, looming today in COVID-19 and also helps to solve a problem that will continue to be a factor going forward. 
COVID-19 testing in the past was done in the lab, as you see in the picture on the left-hand side. Uh, because of the strains of that, um, that crisis, we're now also developing mobile ways, basically plugging something into your mobile phone to diagnose COVID-19. And by doing so, being able to provide high volume healthcare that's contactless. So this is, uh, this is what's happening today. This is work that's being done at the University of Utah. This work was originally begun to, uh, uh, address the diagnosis of Zika, Lassa fever, and hemorrhagic fever. Because of COVID-19, because of the strain that it put on our testing infrastructure, the technology has been repurposed and uh, we, we can solve the problem today. How do we diagnose COVID-19? But if we're able to do so, we create a platform that can help us diagnose other diseases going forward. Mobile devices are very powerful. Um, as you can see in the article here, um, you can turn your mobile phone into an ultrasound scanner. Uh, this is a way of delivering very scalable uh, healthcare and helping bring healthcare to regions that may otherwise not have access. And here's another paper detecting middle ear fluid using smartphones, even detecting oral cancer using machine learning and uh, uh, mobile phone cameras. And the Food and Drug Administration is starting to approve some of these mobile-based solutions, you know, things that help us achieve scalability. Here you see mobile phone urine testing approved by the FDA. Um, cardiogram is uh, able to diagnose di uh, diabetes, signals of di uh, diabetes using wearable devices. And we've just had the first prescription video game approved by the FDA for children with ADHD. So children need no longer be ex have to be exposed um, to uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, they may be more scalably treated by something as simple as a video game. Um, there are many technology disruptors today which are helping us innovate. Um, there's the increased virtualization that COVID-19 has afforded to us. Uh, 5G is becoming a reality, and certainly we can use this for enabling multiplayer gaming, or perhaps it'll be more impactful by using it for telehealth. It's a great enabling technology. Uh, data is becoming ever more hyperdimensional. You saw that in the examples of the uh, um, detecting uh, uh, mental illnesses and depression. Um, the flu diagnosis of using all these different data signals that are being created and collected by mobile devices and using them to be able to do things like diagnosis. Uh, behavioral economics has become a, a very strong platform providing uh, areas of treatment and prevention. And certainly data ethics is always important whenever data is involved. So the time for innovation is now. F of X is equal to F of Y. In the age of COVID-19, we have healthcare demands outstripping healthcare resources. That's creating that space in between those two lines with the double-sided blue arrow. Uh, that's where the innovation opportunity lies. Um, but that graph looks exactly like uh, what our healthcare environment and landscape will look like after COVID-19. Healthcare demands will continue to outstrip healthcare resources. There will always be that gap between the two. Uh, and once again, innovation lies there. So thank you very much. I'll leave you with a quote from William Watkinson. Uh, it's always better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Thank you so much for your time. Hope to see you at Berkeley and the Sutarja Center very soon.